Well, it is good to be back. Uh, I, if you don't know, I was gone for five weeks this summer. Our family uh, uh, was back in Michigan. Jory grew up in Chicago, and our family uh, always had a beach house in Michigan, so we were we were back there, and uh, uh, we had a we had a lot of fun. I do a lot of. Uh, preparing for messages for, for the year and reading and, 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 and doing that, so I did a lot of that. Uh, one of the things unusual this summer was Jory, my wife, was uh, in charge of the high school program. This is a community that has a K through uh, 12 uh, youth program in the summer, so she hired a guy and a gal to oversee the high school and middle school programs, or no, high school programs. And, but, but she was busy doing a, a lot of things uh, during, uh, during the summer, kind of major event every week. Uh, like one was uh, a Sadie Hawkins thing, and the girls draw a boy's name and chase the boy around, and it ends up, you know, and then they uh, dinner at night. Another one is uh, Wells Fargo, uh, boys draw girls' names, and the same thing reversed, and ends up in a, a big uh, banquet together at night. So. Um, Kind of the center point of our uh, trip was uh, uh, Erica's birthday, and our family, uh, uh, some, some of our family gathered uh, that week and had a great time together. It was a big birthday, her 16th, and um, we, uh, <clears throat> she got, you know, plenty of presents, but uh, she ended up kind of sad, and so Jory was saying, well, what's wrong? And, well, I thought... On the 16th birthday, I was supposed to have a date with dad and get a ring. You know, we have a kind of tradition. I take, uh, you know, a 16-year-old out for, you know, a dinner or something and present them a ring that's like a purity ring. Save yourself for your husband. And uh, so we still have, Jory and I still have that to get and, and uh, schedule with, with Erica. But how about I sing about it, okay? So, um, oh, dear. You ready for this? Okay, okay. Family went to Michigan, had a lot of fun. Prayed with, played with our kids out in the sun. Jamie was a lifeguard at the lake. If someone was struggling, a save she would make. Lifeguards did training, push-ups at the beach. The guys challenged Jamie, but her guns were out of reach. City Road, take me home. Stands, travel by summer's end. Now she's flying to Italy to see her new boyfriend. Erica had a birthday, she felt like a queen. It was a big one, she turned 16. She got lots of presents. But she ended sad because she didn't get a ring date from dad. City Road, take me home to the place I belong. PDX Church, Portland, Oregon, take me home. called Sadie Hawkins Day. The girls draw a boy's name and cats chase mice to play. Another is Wells Fargo. It gives her quite a thrill. If Erica had her way, she'd be in Michigan still. Sing with me, City Road. Take me home. Oregon, 
take me home, City Road. Once again, City Road, <laughs> take me home to the place. A little bit silly, huh? Yeah. Well, you know, life is filled with a lot of fun things. There are a lot of things that are challenges in life, but there are also a lot of good things. We all want to be happy, have a great life. Working guitar. Yeah, Chuck, thanks. You want to take over? No, I'm <coughs> right right Okay. So the framers of our Constitution, or Declaration of Independence, wrote, all people are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of... We all want to be happy. I remember when I was in ninth grade praying to God and saying, God, if you just help me make the ninth grade boys basketball team, I will, that will make my life great I'll be happy the rest of my life. I'll never ask you for anything again. Well, fortunately for me, most of the guys in my high school were nerds, so I made the team. <laughs> and I had a great, great time. But by the end of the year, I realized that that doesn't make for happiness. What does it take to be happy? So what are we taught in our culture? What do we, what do we hear on advertisements and uh, TV and movies? Just shout out some things. What? Stuff. Stuff. Money. Money. Cars. Nice car. Yeah. So all that, all that stuff. What does Jesus teach? Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. He comes, he claims to be the Son of God, and he says, I'm the authority on what brings real life. What Jesus teaches about happiness is surprising. There are a lot of things Jesus teaches that are surprising. Some are so counterintuitive, I wish he had never said them. Watch this. Maybe. Maybe. Even the most adamant unbeliever can admit that Jesus <clears throat> had profound wisdom. But not everything Jesus said is easy to accept. Like, blessed are those who are persecuted. Really? Or don't worry. And don't judge. That isn't easy. What about turn the other cheek? What? Always? We'll dive in and see what he meant in our new series, Things I Wish Jesus Never Said. So today we have a starting a new series and we're going to start with what Jesus teaches about how we can find happiness and true life. Now you may not believe in Jesus. You may not believe that he's the son of God, that he was raised from the dead. You may not believe in God. You could not have picked a more perfect Sunday to attend. You're going to find out today what Christ followers really believe. So we read in Matthew 5, When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed means happy or truly happy. You're filled with life. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They find life. They get to go to heaven. They find heaven here in this life. So who finds happiness? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Are you kidding me, Jesus? Why didn't you say the strong in spirit? Those that have grit. 
Why didn't you say the rich in spirit? Those that really seem to be spiritually attuned. The poor in spirit. Jesus says being poor in spirit is the way to life. So what does it mean to be poor in spirit? I think from what Jesus teaches here, it means at least four things. One, we recognize we need God. If you're new to church or uncertain what you believe, this helps you understand what Christ followers believe. If you've ever been in a 12-step program or you're aware of it, you know the step one is we admit we are powerless. It's like waving the white flag, saying, I give up. Everything I've tried to beat this addiction doesn't work. I can't beat it. This admission, admission goes against everything we're taught in our culture. We're taught to say, I'm strong. I'm independent. I'm good. I can fix this. We're taught to say, if you have an addiction, just stop. Saying you're powerless is a cop-out. Take responsibility for yourself. Saying take responsibility for yourself and just stop sounds so morally right, so superior. It sounds God-fearing. But the truth is that Jesus' message is way tougher. What Christ followers believe is a lot harder. Jesus teaches you truly are powerless to change yourself. You are poor in spirit. You are unable. And you are responsible for yourself. Now, when you put inability and responsibility together, you are painted into a corner. You're now responsible for yourself and unable to do anything about it. That's a much tougher message. It leads to, please, somebody help me. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. He says, I am like the tree, the trunk of the tree. You are the branches that bear fruit. But everybody knows a branch is not going to bear any fruit if it gets disconnected from the trunk, right? And Jesus says, that's the reality in life. This may be the most important message of the Bible. God sends his son to the world and says, I made you. I love you. You can bear fruit. You can make a difference in this world. But you need me. You can't do it without me. I will come into your life. I will work in you. But you have to ask me. You have to admit that you need me. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is by Isaiah chapter 40. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. He says every one of us stumbles and falls, even young people. We're all poor in spirit. But those who wait on the Lord, admit their need for Him, will soar like eagles and not get weary and not faint. Those of you that attend church here regularly know that I try to start every one of my days with what I call chair time. I sit in my favorite chair in my study at home and I read the Bible. I answer two or three questions in our journal and then I pray about the day. At some point in that prayer, I will say something like, God, I need you today. I've got so many challenges, I don't really know how to fix. On my own, I, I know I'll make mistakes. I'll blow it. I need you to guide me. The second thing... I think Jesus teaches it means to be poor in spirit is in the next verse. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. We mourn for our sins. People who find real life 
The truly happy people are those who realize they need God and they sin against God, so they mourn for their sins. We feel truly sorry for the ways we fail, disobey God, and hurt people each day. We repent of our sins. One of the verses that we were led to in our journals, I appreciate uh, the, the, the people in our church who write these journals. They send us to verses that support the, the main text we're going to be talking about, uh, other places in the Bible. And one they took us to is David uh, in Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. God forgives those who ask him to, and he comforts the brokenhearted, those who are going through sadness and loss. So we mourn for our sins, and we mourn for the sins of the world. The murders and shootings in Chicago, the ISIS terrorist attack at the Ariana Grande concert in Manchester, England. White supremacist violence and murder in Charlottesville, Virginia. The Antifa violence in Berkeley, Colorado, or, or California and elsewhere. We mourn for all the terrible things that happen in this world as a result of our collective turning away from God. The third thing I think Jesus teaches that it means to be poor in spirit is in the next verse, blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. We recognize how much we sin and fall short. We don't hold an overly inflated, narcissistic view of ourselves. We're humble. Jesus surprises us in this. We think that the humble will get, will get trampled. But Isaiah says, these are the ones I look on with favor, those who are humble and contrite in heart and who tremble at my word. God looks with favor on people who are humble. That's why the humble do okay, because God takes care of them, and they tremble at his word. When they read the Bible, they realize the Bible is God's word to us on how life works, who God is, and how we can know him. We tremble. We don't read it casually. They also sent us in the journal to Proverbs 3.34. He mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to the humble and oppressed. In 1 Samuel, in the Bible, uh, we learn about David, the king of Israel. God spoke to Samuel, the prophet, and said, Go to Jesse and anoint one of his sons the next king of Israel. So Jesse has all his sons lined up, uh, ready to meet Samuel and Samuel sees the first one, Eliab, and God says to him, it's not him. He's tall, he's handsome, he's wearing the military garb, looks like the perfect candidate. God says, don't look on the outside. I look on the inside. The second one, God says the same thing to Samuel, it's not him either. He goes through seven sons. And Samuel says to uh, uh, Jesse, do you have any other sons? And Jesse's thinking, well, yeah, I got one more, but it can't be him. He's young. He's scrawny. He says, I got one. He's out in the back tending the sheep. Samuel says, I won't sit until you bring him. And as soon as David came in, God spoke to Samuel, said, this is the one, and he anointed him king of Israel. David was 17. He didn't become king until he was 30. God used 13 years to prepare him. And one day when David was still quite young, uh, his father said to him, take, take a lunch to your brothers. They're serving in the army on the front lines. And David could have said to him, come on, Dad, you were there. You saw Samuel anoint me. I'm the next king of Israel. I'm not a delivery boy. But he was humble. He took them food. And because of that, he was there when Goliath, the giant of the Philistines, came out and was taunting the army of Israel and, and, and taunting God and saying, defy the God of Israel. Who will come out and fight me? And whoever wins will win the battle. But everybody was afraid of him. And David says, who's this guy to taunt God? I'll fight him. God will help me. And he defeated him and became the most popular warrior in Israel. Peter says, humble yourselves under the mighty, God's mighty hand that he may lift you up 
in due time. Patrick Lencioni is a uh, consultant to executives. Uh, he's frequently a speaker at the Global Leadership Summit that Jory and I go to in Chicago each year. One of his latest books is called The Ideal Team Player. He says, if you want to hire for your company the ideal worker to fit into your team, they need to have three qualities. One, they have to be smart. He's not talking about intellectually smart. He's talking about a, a, a people smart. They, they can read people. They can get along with people. They're, they're good emotionally and, and relationally. Second, they have to be hungry. They have to be hard workers. Whenever you have somebody who's lazy, everybody around them resents them because they don't pull their weight. And third, he says, most importantly, they have to be humble. They're not narcissistic. They don't make everything about themselves. They care more about the team, the overall success. The last thing I think it means that Jesus teaches that it means to be poor in spirit is verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. We hunger and thirst for righteousness. We recognize we need God. We mourn for our sins. We're humbled by how poor in spirit we are. So we hunger and thirst to be more like Jesus Christ, to be better. When our daughter, 21-year-old, now 21-year-old daughter Cam was a baby, when she was hungry, she let us know. And if we didn't bring her her bottle, she would cry all the louder. Oh, could she cry. I mean, it was a blood-curdling cry. I mean, babies, when they wake up hungry in the middle of the night, they don't say, oh, it's 2 a.m., mom and dad are probably sleeping, I'll, uh, I'll just sit tight and ignore my hunger and look at my mobile and suck on my fist and, you know, wait till 7 a.m. I mean, no baby thinks like that. Babies need to be fed like 8 to 12 times a day and most of those seem to be clustered in the night when mom's sleeping. When a baby is hungry, they cry out to have their hunger satiated. Peter says, like newborn babies, crave spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. We need to grow we need to be yearning, aching, longing to grow up so that we can become all that God wants us to be and please Him. So we want to read the Bible. We want to use the journal or something like this. I mean, this is one of the things that is unique about Portland Community Church. I don't know of any other church that provides this. Something you can study during the weeks so when you come back and uh, we speak on Sunday mornings, you've already thought about what we're talking about. Studies show that if you want to make change in your life, you need to see something three or more times. So we feature this in most of our community groups. So you have a chance of possibly studying this on your own, talking about it in a community group, then hearing about it on Sunday morning, and you have a much greater likelihood that you'll actually do something about the subject at hand. If we desire to grow, we realize that growth comes through God's truth. And we'll long for that truth with the same devotion that a baby longs for its mother's milk. So high schooler, you need the Bible and the time to learn to be spending time with God is when you're young. Young married, you need God's Word in your life to help you know how to be the best wife, the best husband. Parent, you need God's truth to help you know how you can be a most effective parent. When to say something, when to not. When to come down hard, when to be gracious. Single person, there are so many options out there today. God's Word gives us the truth of which way to go. Grandparent, God's truth will help you know how you can 
be the greatest help to your grandchild. Now, what we're talking about today is so important. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Being poor in spirit, Jesus says, is the way to life. If you're just checking out faith, you need to understand this. Parents, this is so important. Are you trying to teach your kids to be good? Or are you teaching their kids that they are poor in spirit and will never be good without Christ and His grace? There's a huge difference. One leads to moralism. The other leads to brokenness. One leads to self-righteousness. The other leads to poverty of spirit and a recognition that we need Christ in our lives every minute of every day. One leads to judgmentalism, which unbelievers find so unattractive in Christians. The other leads to humility and graciousness. The Christian faith is not about making bad people moral. It's about making dead people alive. So when I have chair time, one of the most important things I do is asking God, help me to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit. If you've given your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you, and the Holy Spirit will prompt you many times during the day. The only question is, do you hear it? Do you listen? Do you respond? I want to be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit this year, and I want you to as well. So teenager, learning to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit is the most important thing you can learn to do well at school. Young single, listening to the Holy Spirit will guide you in the right ways to go. Young marrieds, the Holy Spirit is the one that can be the, the oil that makes a marriage work, prompting you to forgive, be kind. Parents, the Holy Spirit will show you how to be a good mom or a good dad. Empty nester, you have maybe more freedom in your life now than ever before. So many things, ways you can go. The Holy Spirit will guide you in the right way. Being poor in spirit is the way to life. When I first read that Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, I thought that can't be right. Now I think it is one of the most important things Jesus ever said and most significant lessons in life. We are poor in spirit, so let's admit it. Lord Jesus, thank you for teaching this. The truly happy, truly life-filled people are poor in spirit and recognize it. We need you. We can't go an hour without you. If you're new to faith, you need to admit this to God, that you need Him, that you can't do life without Him. I want to give you all a minute now just to talk to God. If, 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 if you feel like, you know, you're, you're new to this whole God thing, but you've heard enough, they just say, God, I, I need you. I want you in my life. I can see that I can't do it without you. You could invite Jesus into your life right now. Say, I believe you're the Son of God. Come into my life. Or maybe you've been a follower of Christ for quite a while. You too need to admit that you need Jesus all the time. So I'll give you a little time to talk to God right now. Every head bowed. It always baffles me, God, that you can hear every one of us talking to you at the same time. 
You're an amazing God. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.